Okay, the following section is our oral presentation section. We have six orals in total, and the first three takes five minutes for each because they are our best paper runners up and best paper award winner. And this, the latter three takes three minutes for each. So the first paper is one of our best paper runners up, and maybe you can take the yeah. turn. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm a research scientist at NVIDIA. I'm Kaylin, uh, and our work is on the integration of teleoperation, planning, and imitation learning for robot manipulation. Imitation learning is a powerful tool for scaling up uh, robot performance. Basically, a human operator teleoperates the robot using like a phone or a space mouse. Then we basically gather a bunch of data and then formalize this as a supervised learning problem or are able to train a robot to autonomously copy the behavior. There's been a recent success in trying to scale this up to really complex tasks, such as Google's RT efforts. Um, however, this can be actually very expensive, both in terms of time and also human effort. Um, and if we want to actually expand beyond to longer horizon tasks or broader distribution of tasks, we need to rethink how we do this. In contrast, uh, planning, and specifically task and motion planning, is entirely automated. It can generalize aggressively across uh, different initial states and goal conditions. That basically the uh, premise is that you define a world model and then chain these skills in order to solve a large uh, variety of tasks. However, it's often difficult to apply these task and motion planning systems to contact-rich interactions because it requires models of the objects and how they're able to interact, as well as accurate perception to estimate their state. In this work, we present Human Loop Task and Motion Planning, or HiddleTAMP, which combines elements of both imitation learning and task and motion planning to achieve complex tasks, like inserting a, a coffee pot into a coffee machine to prepare coffee. Our system has two phases. First, at training time, we basically combine TAMP and teleoperation in order to be able to collect data. Namely, what we do is that the TAMP system basically plans and then defers execution of certain skills to a human teleoperator. This produces a data set, and then we're able to deploy supervised learning to train a policy on it. Then, at test time, we're able to replace the teleoperation with the, human, uh, with the learned policy in order to achieve fully autonomous behavior. Here's an example of the first phase of our task, where we basically alternate between a planning segment and a human teleoperation segment, where planning does everything except for the insertion of the object into the stand and then hanging the wrench on the tool. And then again, we gather data and we're able to train a learn policy to basically replace that human teleoperation component to achieve fully autonomous behavior. The biggest challenge when trying to combine um, teleoperation and planning is that we need a model of the tele teleoperation process in order to be able to then plan to it and also beyond it. This requires understanding kind of the preconditions and effects of the teleoperation process. For example, if we have an action that describes the insertion process in this tool hang demo, which might involve entities such as the tool, the stand, and the relative poses between them, we need to characterize the initial pose that the tool should be at in order to instigate the human teleoperating effectively and efficiently. The way we do this is we actually deploy constraint learning on a small scale that we're able to collect a couple human demonstrations of the human doing this. We're able to then extract out the distribution of relative poses and then learn a simple generative model for this distribution that we then can plan with. Uh, one kind of interesting aspect of our approach is that because it's semi-automated and that the uh, human is idle for periods of time, that we can actually deploy the human to control several robots at once, for example, six robots using something called fleet control where basically the TAMP system submit jobs to the human in a queue. The human will process sequentially, um, and that way the human's always productive um, and can maximize data collection throughput. And we can deploy this both in simulation by just spawning multiple environments and also in a factory setting if we have multiple physical robots. Um, we were able to find that our system allows us to actually, even with novice uh, demonstrators, train really proficient agents that here with just 10 minutes of data collection that we're able to get 98% success rate on the left task and 86 on the right task. So it's very accessible to kind of, uh, I guess, novice operators. We compared our system to a conventional teleoperation system and found that it greatly reduced the time it takes to collect 200 demonstrations. Uh, and then we also, of course, uh, deployed our approach on different tasks. For example, uh, this distribution of 12 tasks and saw almost perfect success rates. And kind of critically, we were able to train policies or to collect data to train policies to solve all these tasks in around only five human hours, which is quite good. We also compared the success rate of our combined approach with a conventional behavior cloning system on conventional data. And we found that our system resulted in much improved success rates. Uh, Additionally, our system can be deployed to much more complex tasks, such as this very long horizon coffee preparation task. This is really where the planning component uh, shines because it's able to reason about which skills are actually required, and then again, defer to a human or to the learn policy to implement the contact-rich parts of the sequence. 
Lastly, we deployed our approach in the real world uh, on a challenging version of this tool hanging task. And we found that we're able to achieve 64% success rate uh, with only 50 demos compared to a baseline of 200 doing normal teleoperation behavior cloning, which gave only 3% success. Uh, thank you all. And then come to our poster for more details about this work. Um, actually, our second presentation is uh, another best paper runner, but, but the author met some un un unresolved conflicts, so cannot be here in person. They actually sent the video recording to us, but due to some incompatibility issue, we're not, we not able to display it here. So we'll post the video on the website, so please feel free to check it out. It's very amazing. Um, okay, let's welcome our third presenter, which, is, which won our best paper award in this workshop. Um, yeah. Oh, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, this is Sri I'm from UCSC. I'm presenting our work, Generalized Animal Imitator Agile Locomotion with Versatile Motion, uh, motion Prior. I I'd like to first show uh, what our robot can do. So here is our ro robot performing a backflip from a box with half, half meter. You can see it can backflip into there and then securely land on the ground without any failure. And this is our robot performing different kind of jumping skills in the wild, and I, I would like to note that all the low-level skills are learned with a single low-level controller. And it's imitating from the animal and animal mo uh, motion capture, and also as well as some uh, trajectory optimization trajectories. For example, the jumping and the backflip are from the trajectory op optimization, and the running and turning skills are from the motion imitation, for, uh, motion capture from the animals. We draw, we draw our motivation from like the real quadrupeds can perform diverse skills with a single mind, of course, and transit from, oh, it's, uh, it's fine. It's just a, just a dog doing some random stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And some, cor but corn quadrupeds robots can do what? We can, you can train a really robust and agile policy for a single task, and you can also train diverse uh, diverse but single skills, for example, for the right one is just doing some uh, turning and working forward. So what's the challenging is actually you, if you want to learn diverse agile uh, skills at all at the same time, it's really hard to def uh, because different skills works on different part of the motion. It's, for example, someone, uh, some motion, uh, some skill is trying to jump high and some is like jumping forward and of course there's another one doing backflip. You can, you cannot actually it's really hard to define a single reward function or, or, or something to learn it all. So, but in our case, we want to learn a diverse, uh, want, uh, want a single policy to imitate the diverse reference motion. Uh, and with generating a uh, low level controller capable of performing different div diverse agile locomotion skills all at the same time. So we, we, uh, we got our, uh, uh, inspiration from how human learn agile skills. A human learn like uh, whether the specific skill is performed successfully or not successfully, and as well as uh, have some kind of detailed instruction about how to move your different joints. So we, we incorporated this into our uh, learning system. So our, our reward function is defined by two parts. One part is our we, we, track, we track the trajectory root states of the robot and also the root state of the reference motion. And we calculate the, the functionality reward, which is defined how, whether, this, whether this robot is successfully uh, tracking the, the root of the, the, the root mo motion of the robots, as well as the joint, joint, joint level reward. The, the first one is like, uh, we, we have a discriminator to discriminate why the, whether this trajectory is reproducing the, the, uh, the gate from the, overall idea like whether it's good or not for this one and also we have some kind of the uh, root, root tracking reward we call it the joint level style reward and then the combined to get, become a really uh, robust style reward to learn the it, it, and all this reward together we can learn a robust uh, robot controller can track the, the the root position and also as the joint level uh, gates and here's our controller structure. So we have a reference encoder, which encodes the reference motion into a latent space. And we also have a, uh, has a proprioception encoder encode the robot state. And then 
feed them together to the low uh, to the lower policy and as well as the uh, critic for the RO training. And here we, we would like to mention like uh, we map the reference motion into a unified latent space which can be used for different different types of uh, downstream tasks. And here we'd like to show what specific agile uh, skills we our policy learned. This is the backflip skills. Skills we can see it can backflip consecutively multiple times and without failing. And we are also showing the reference motion on the top and as well as our baseline works. So basically, like if you are learning with purely adversarial reward, it can only uh, it's the mode collapse to some simple simple motion like. Uh, Jump uh, like standing down and fall fall down, and but the motion motion imitation methods can learn to track the root position, but not the style of the gate. As well as the jumping forward, we can see our robot can jump in real reason, reasonable distance and reasonably high. Compare with baselines, can only capture the root state motion or the joint motion without complete the, the whole agile locomotion skills and all the time without uh, maintaining the skill and the style at the same time. Yeah. This is, a third, this is a third demo. Our robot is jumping while running and <coughs> we also compare with different baselines what the baseline can do. You can see the baseline, if you, we wanted to track multiple agile locomotion skills, they do some really weird stuff. We can also enable it to join really fast. We also did some additional deployment in the real world to see how robust all, all these skills are. This is like jumping forward on a really high tasks. Considering the robot size, <coughs> it's, it's, it's almost like two times high, uh, higher than the robots. also jumping up from the in the wild and landing into some soft soft trains this is our robots jumping and while it's running forward and oh, sorry uh, thank you for thank you for being here and if you want to no more results as, as please stop by our poster. Yeah, thank you. Our next presenter, please get ready. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to present our work on uh, deep evidential traversability learning for achieving a risk aware off road navigation, such as in the environment like the one shown on the right. Uh, this is a joint work with colleagues at MIT, uh, Army Research Lab, uh, Boston Dyna Dynamics AI Institute, and Northeastern University. So, the goal of this work is to achieve fast navigation in an off road environment. However, uh, there are a few challenges that can be illustrated in the uh, video shown on the left where we're using a spot robot and we commanded it to uh, walk through vegetation, such as uh, the one shown in the video. But the robot really struggled to walk through vegetation due to the default collision avoidance behavior that tried to avoid uh, high elevation terrains. However, doing so can be too conservative. Uh, therefore, uh, it's useful to incorporate uh, semantic information into the decision-making process. However, uh, manually designed planning costs based on semantic and geometric features can be uh, very difficult and require a lot of human expertise. Uh, recently, uh, self-supervised learning uh, is increasingly being used to learn uh, terrain properties uh, directly from uh, navigation data. Uh, however, challenges remain to properly quantify and actually handle uh, the risks due to uh, uncertainties in the learn model. Specifically, there's aleatoric uncertainty. That's the inherent and irreducible uncertainty due to partial observability. For instance, the terrain that's indistinguishable to the onboard sensors may lead to different uh, vehicle terrain interactions. And epistemic uncertainty that's due to out of distribution inputs encountered at test time. In this work, we consider both the uncertainty aware traversability learning problem, and then we achieve uh, downstream risk or motion planning. 
We focus on learning terrain traction, uh, where traction measures the ratio between the commanded and the achieved velocity by the robot. Uh, during data collection, we, we drove the robot around and we created a semantic octomap that uh, captures both the elevation and semantics, which are used to predict the traction values. To capture aleatoric uncertainty, we directly learn a distribution over the traction values. Uh, and for the epistemic uncertainty, we estimate the densities of the traction predictors' latent features. Uh, in order to jointly train uh, these two modules, we use evidential deep learning and parameterize Dirichlet distributions using the network output, where a Dirichlet distribution essentially captures a distribution over the target traction distribution. And the entire network can be trained using expected cross entropy loss uh, derived under the Dirichlet distribution. So at deployment, uh, deployment time, uh, we handle aleatoric uncertainty by measuring the risk of encountering uh, low traction. Uh, using conditional value at risk, or CVAR, that measures the worst case expected outcome. And instead of using the nominal rollouts, we use the uh, CVAR of traction for the state uh, forward simulation. Um, yes, and uh, for the epistemic uncertainty, we identify regions that have low latent uh, densities and avoid them uh, using auxiliary uh, costs during planning. Um, so uh, we tested the overall pipeline both indoors on an RC car and outdoors uh, on a spot robot. The takeaway is that our method that uses the CVAR of uh, traction outperforms methods that assume the expected or the nominal traction or the one that directly optimized for the CVAR of the uh, objective. And also we show that avoiding OOD terrains can lead to more reliable navigation. Uh, more information is in the paper and I'm happy to talk more during the poster session. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Yifeng Zhu from UT Austin. I'm glad to present our recent work, Lotus, that tackles lifelong robot learning problems in the domain of robot manipulation. And the first author is Wang from Peking University. So imagine that we're going to have a home robot that autonomously learns a series of household chores, like to customers to your like home preferences, like prepare dinner, do the laundry, or set up a bathroom. A characteristic of this is that the robot will have distributions that are never seen before and needs to continually learn new tasks across its learning process. And this leads to the problem of lifelong robot learning. And one key feature is, is that it's going to need the ability to adapt to new tasks efficiently and quickly while not forgetting the previous tasks it has learned. And these two points corresponding to the two major points of lifelong robot learning, which is forward transfer and, uh, forward transfer and backward transfer. And let's see a simple example of lifelong robot learning. It first for example, in this task, it first needs to learn, open the top drawer and put the pink mug inside it. And then in, in, like in the future, you will need to learn a new task, which is put the pink mug inside top drawer and close the drawer. Uh, and close the drawer. So basically, if we train mono monolithic neural networks to train uh, to continually learn these tasks, it will, it will easily go into this catastrophic forgetting failure or induce a expensive competition uh, load to retrain the policy. So instead, we need to, like, we can actually leverage a key insight here. So in this task, it's basically these tasks have the compositional task structures. And, when, uh, and in the new task, uh, it can reuse the previous skill in the first beginning and then only learn the later part to learn the new, new behaviors. So these these tasks in the live learning actually share some recurring patterns, and that's uh, and the recurring patterns exist in our everyday life a lot. So uh, so basically, this can this can lead to a very reliable live on learning uh, learning algorithms if we can leverage this uh, inductive bias. But then, how do we obtain the compositional structure without additional annotations and in face of these distribution shifts? So we present Lotus, a lifelong knowledge transfer using skills. So basically, Lotus identify temporal segments from the sequence of new task demonstration and partition temporal segments into training data. So 
Lotus offers in two stages. In the base, in the beginning, it does a multi-skill library to initialize a skill library, a skill discovery to initialize skill library. Then in the lifelong learning stage, the robot identifies new skills from new tasks to expand the skill library, while existing skills in the library are also updated. So in the first, in the base task stage, we will first use a bottom-up approach, hierarchical clustering, to identify temporal segments in each demonstration. And it, this is based on our prior work bus. But one challenge here is that every new task is actually out of new prior distributions. So as you can see, like we encode the image states using Dino V2 feature, which is a very powerful per train vision model to, that can give general semantic feature that work in the open world scenarios so that we can uh, from the bus, we can uh, discover the uh, discover the temporal segments, and we can partition segments based on the segment similarities, which is done by global pooling on the uh, Dino V2 features. And these partition temporal segments are used to train the skill libraries. And this bottom-up approach is repeated every time in the lifelong learning stages. Uh, but one difference is that in the lifelong learning state, we need to identify if the new temporal segments is, are belong to previous skills or it should be classified as new skills. To this end, we introduce an incremental clustering approach, which computes the similarity between the new segments and previous partitions to decide if a new temporal segment should be clustered in an existing set of skills or should be considered as the new ones. And, and this process is repeated over and over again so that it can learn uh, multiple skill libraries. And with this uh, continually growing skill libraries, we can train man multitask manager controllers to invoke these skills so that it can accomplish a sequence of tasks across the robot's lifespan. And here's a highlight of our uh, results without uh, using annotations and discover the skills in a lifelong learning fashion. So first of all, similar motion are more likely to cluster to the same skill, which is also what we want we want expected so that we can achieve this forward transfer reusing the previous skills. And also new skills that are uh, new skills uh, in the new task will be reused in the previous task so, so that it can achieve backward transfer. And this is also desirable so that actually the robot is actually improving its abilities, not just sticking to the previous set of skills, but also using new skills even on the task that it has learned before. So to learn more about Lotus, please come to our poster session. And thank you. Last presenter. Hmm? Sound on the slides. Uh -huh. This video has one of oh. sounds. Uh, we are not able to display the sound because no, everything like, are muted. This one can. Because yeah, this one is this mic is open. If I enable the sound, it will have sound. So yeah, that's what, that's what. Okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Ananya Agarwal, and I'm going to present our work, Extreme Parkour with Legged Robots. This joint work with Shushan, Kashin, and Deepak. So we've seen uh, lots of results on vision-based locomotion in the past. And these are robots which can walk on these surfaces just with a single depth camera as shown here. But this here, the robot still has a chance to recover from failure. And this is still like fairly static behavior. Can we learn a single vision policy for agile parkour? So here, uh, there's, there are two main challenges, which is that there's a huge exploration burden. And the robot also needs to change direction rapidly when on these very challenging terrains. In our work, we use a very simple reward function, which is to minimize energy and just track the velocity, which leads to emergent, um, emergent behavior for traversing these terrain. Uh, quickly. Yeah, let's just quickly skip, skip to the results. Uh, so here you can see that our robot is um, doing this very challenging course. Here the gap between these two is like twice the length of the robot. Here the height is twice the, twice the height of the robot. And you can see emergent behavior where the robot steps close to the gap and then jumps up to, um, uh, to go very high. This is a stair handstand, so the robot can do a handstand while going down, downstairs. This is a full parkour course. So the robot first uh, jumps over this hurdle, 
then it jumps over uh, two subsequent blocks, then it just does these ramp changes. And note that it's completely autonomous. We are not controlling the direction with the joystick. The robot looks at the course and decides what the direction, what is the best direction to take. Here you see an emergent jump. So it saw a gap and jumped over, over the gap. It, the handstand itself is very robust. You can it can go on like deformable surfaces, um, grass. You can push and pull the robot, um, and it no, doesn't fall. Here we do a pressure test to show like this is not just like cherry pick result. We can like keep running the robot, and it keeps jumping over all these gaps and these high terrain. Yeah. For more details about the method and how and like hardware deployment, uh, please visit our poster. <laughs>